Let's worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things.
guys can have a seat for a moment. Whew. Are we happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I'm out of breath singing, and I get to do the welcome. So, uh, everybody, welcome. Uh, if you are a guest with us this morning, we are pleasantly and uh, just pleased that you are here. I'm trying to figure out what I'm saying as I'm saying it. <laughs> We are just pleased and thrilled that you are here, and we're happy that you chose to join us this morning. In the seat back in front of you, you should find a little guest card, if you would. Uh, fill that out. Um, drop it in the offering plate as it comes by. We would love to know that you were here with us this morning. Uh, I promise the deacons won't show up at your house. Pastor Jim might. I don't know. I can't make any promises there. The crutches may keep them from doing it right now. <laughs> uh, but we would love to just to, to know that you were here that so we can pray for you um, that, that would be a great thing for us to be able to do um, rolling right along uh, we put out in the bulletin last week we had little flyers but uh, Lacey if you could throw that up there about D now uh, we are doing a D now for our youth and it is November 12th through the 14th uh, the services will be happening at Parkway Baptist Church, and this is a group of a whole bunch of churches in our area that are getting together to do a D-Now. I think this is probably a product of COVID because so many churches have seen their youth numbers drop. For, the, for, for youth groups to do something like a D-Now, all of us youth pastors have gone, hey, we need to do this together so that we can pool our resources and, and, and do it well. Um, and so youth... More information to come. I can tell you that the speaker for this weekend is the Augusta BCM campus minister, Jesse Holmes, um, which is one of the reasons why I felt comfortable doing this, because I know Jesse personally. He's come here and spoke to our youth twice, and he is an awesome guy, and he has a love for students and all students. Uh, he is now the volunteer campus minister there, and he is on staff at Crawford Avenue. Baptist Church in Augusta, where he is in charge of their discipleship and youth ministries as well. So he is almost doing two different ministry jobs at once. He has a busy schedule. Um, but I highly encourage our youth to sign up for this, and I need to know ASAP if this is something you're interested in. And if funds are an issue, don't let that stop you from going. Come see me, and we can figure something out. Um, the cost for the weekend is $40. Uh, I know that's not something that everybody plans for. Again, if, it's, if money is an issue, come see me one-on-one, -on -one and we will find ways to make it work. Um, let's continue on in worship. I will pray, and then, we'll, and then we will keep going. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you so much for this morning. I just thank you for your presence being here this morning. I pray that you would work in and through this service, Father, and that who we are when we leave these doors, we would not be the same person we were when we walked in. And Father, I just pray for the message that you will bring here real soon. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Stand with us as we continue our worship, please. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount of poor, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse. Oh, 
Please come forward. That's grace. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We just thank you for this day and we thank you for your grace, Lord. We pray for those bereaved lost loved ones that you be with them. Remember the Walden family, the Hayes family, and the Evans family, Lord. We just pray that you give them the comfort and assurance that only the Holy Spirit can do. We pray for this offering that it be a further work to glorify your name here. We pray for those that are sick and hurting that you'd uplift them and heal them, Lord. We pray for this nation that the leaders of it would seek you. And Lord, we just ask that uh, you be at this service and fill our hearts and our minds with your word and help us to live it, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for everything. And most of all, we thank you for salvation in Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. 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 Suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry From north to south In the east to west We hear Christ be magnified from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Be magnified in me. Oh, Christ, be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ, be magnified. Every you 
to go to our altar time. So if you would like to join me in praying at the altar. Now that I put my guitar down and I can come down here. If you would, remember uh, Lee Hayes and Johnny Hayes' family. She passed away this morning, if you have not heard that. Um, I'm very saddened to hear of that. The times that I did get to spend with her, it was a great time. And she was just a lovely, kind, loving person. She could be a fireball if she wanted to, though. (laughs) Uh, And we need to remember Randy Walden's brother and, and your family. We're praying for you as well. We're very sorry for you, and and our heart goes out for you. And uh, let's remember the family of Johnny Evans as well as they deal with everything that they're having to deal with, uh, with the property and and, and all those things. Um, Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning with heavy hearts because of things that are going on here, Father. We come to you looking for comfort for wisdom, for knowledge, knowing that you are faithful and gracious to give those things to us because of your love for us. Father, we just pray that you would continue to just work in this church, that this church would become a light on a hill shining for all to see, reflecting your love. We pray for all these families, for the Hayes family, for the Walden family, and for the Evans family, Father, that you would just be with them, comfort them, give grace and understanding. But most of all, Lord, just wrap these families, wrap this church, wrap this community in your arms, and let your presence be known, let your love be known. And let your truth be preached. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. One more thing. If you didn't know, Pastor Tracy is not here this morning. That's the reason I was doing all the things that he normally does. 
We have a special guest speaker. He's especially more special to me, probably, than anybody else in the room. My dad, Joe Graham, is going to be with us. I, there's some things that I need to fill you in on here. Just recently, as of September 30th, he no longer works for the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. He has retired. Uh, He spent 38 years working in our state to reach college students, and probably four or five years before that in Virginia. Um, I know a lot of pastors, I know a lot of people that do ministry, because I've been doing this ministry now for, what years, 14 years. I've met a lot of guys that, that stand up in pulpits or get behind guitars or talk to youth. I have not met one that has had the impact that my dad has. 38 years, he has been working either as a campus minister in our state level convention, reaching college students. To give you an example, every year, our BCMs throughout the state raise money for a thing called Send Me Now Summer Missions. This is where college students raise money to send their classmates on mission trips at no cost to them. And it's all done through the BCMs. Last year, at the height of the pandemic, our BCM, Georgia Baptist College Students, raised over $140,000, and that allowed over 90 college students to go on mission trips in the state, in the country, and across the globe. Normally, it's in the 150 to 200 range. COVID lessened the numbers a little bit, but my dad is always in that process. He supervised all the campus ministers across the state the full-time, part-time, and volunteer campus ministers. He was a shepherd and a pastor to those campus ministers who then had an impact on all the college students that would come into those ministries. I cannot tell you the thousands of people, if not tens of thousands of people, that my dad has had an impact on. Normally, when you get to do things like this, I get to say things that he wouldn't say about himself. And it's not every day that you get to brag on your dad, publicly at least. <laughs> so along with me, would you guys please thank him for the last 38 years that he has given. Come on. Yep. I'll stop talking now. Be with you all today. Um, it's not too often that you hear somebody bragging on their dad. Um, it it would scare most of us if our kids get up to introduce us, wouldn't it? Um, but I am very proud of him and them, uh, Lacey and the kids. You all, Tracy is on vacation this week. Uh, COVID has has gotten a hold of everybody over the last few months, just about one way or the other. And uh, Tracy is taking some vacation time, not recuperation time. There's a difference. There's a big difference. Uh, you all have become a bit of a second home church for us. Having kids and grandkids in a church will do that. Um, it'll do that every time. So I'm happy to be here today. And uh, I know you all have just finished a series on the Sermon on the Mount. Though we're going to start in Second Chronicles, I promise we're going to wind it back to, to touch on the, the Sermon on the Mount just a bit toward the end. This passage is, is honestly one of my favorites. Back in the, the 70s when the Jesus movement was going on, uh, I, that's when uh, I came to Christ. 
was right in that time. And uh, I never forget the song, If My People. And there was a whole musical dedicated to these verses. I will not unbless you by trying to sing it today. But I am going to try to, to lead us through this passage because it's very, very rich. It speaks to each of us individually, if you'll let it. It speaks to us collectively as God's people in this church, if you'll let it. It speaks to us as Christians living in this nation, if we'll let it. And it speaks to us as believers as we try to reach the nations. Yep, if we let it. And now the passage from Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Boy, do we need our land healed. Boy, do we need our souls and our spirits healed. A couple of quick points about this passage you need to know. This is one of the the times, over a thousand times, that the word if is used in Scripture. And it's almost always followed by a then. Not always, but, but often it's followed by a then. Some people see that, well, if then, if God's trying to make a deal with me. No, God is not trying to make a deal with you with this passage. These are promises. There's a difference between a deal and a promise with this God. Promises that are conditional, though, on our faith and discipleship. If we will be true to who we've been called to be, these are promises. The most significant conditional promise in Scripture is found in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that, you could put the word if in here for what we're doing, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The promise is there if you believe in him. It's a promise you will have eternal life. Number two, it's also important to keep this passage together. I've, I've heard some sermons where they, they kind of pick on each piece of this and, and you, you, you say, well, let's, let's deal with the first part. Let, let's deal with the uh, humble yourselves. We, let's spend a whole sermon on that. Let, let's have a prayer. Let's have a sermon on prayer. Let's have a sermon on seeking his face. And then let's have a sermon on turning from our wicked ways. Nobody enjoys those sermons, do they? But it's really, really important to understand that God never intended us to pick this passage apart. He intended intended it for us to understand together. So, the other thing people say is, okay, this is a process. Maybe I need to humble myself, then, then I'll learn how to pray, then, then I'll seek God's face, then, then, maybe then, sort of then, kind of then, I'll turn from my wicked ways. It really is not designed to be broken down like that. This is designed for us to learn how to humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways. At the same time. The reality is, if you are seeking his face, believed this verse, it will transform your, transform your life. You don't have to Wonder if I can do this a step at a time. If you pray, if you humble yourself, if you seek his face, 
it's amazing how much easier it is to fix the things in your life that need to be fixed. And also how hard it is to fix them without doing this. What does it mean to be God's people? If my people, he says. We, we're used to the phrase, my people. I, my people are from the mountains of Virginia. My people are the Grams and the Eanses. You talk about your people. Sometimes folks say things and you say, don't talk about my people like that. My people. But what does it mean when God says, my people? What does it mean to be God's people? If my people, God says. It really starts with who are you? Uh, you if you're not God's people, you probably don't understand this very well. In this passage, it goes deeper. If my people who are called by my name. You aren't, God, you aren't God's people because your grandmother was God's people. You're not God's people because your daddy was one of God's people. My people. And you aren't God's people just because you're sitting here this morning. <laughs> you, you're, you're in a great place. You've taken a great step. But this doesn't make you God's people. God's people become something you live out. And something that's real within you. It's the total package. I want to tell you a story of someone who humbled himself, prayed, and sought God's face. And this person is me. I will never forget, before Chris settled into baseball with his life, he played football at Shiloh High School. And I went to games as any dad would go to games. I went to touchdown club game, member game, uh, meetings as anybody would go to those. And God just kept saying something that I really wished he wouldn't say to my spirit. <laughs> he said, Joe, these people need somebody like you to be a chaplain. I don't know how many games, I don't know how many touchdown club meetings I went to, I don't know how many times it took God to get through to me, but it took a lot. I said, God, we We've talked about this. You called me to work with college students. Remember? Remember? And he wouldn't say anything else until the next time I would go to a touchdown club meeting. As I watched the boys and the coaches, I kept sensing that God really does want to use me in some role that I've never had taken on before. At the last touchdown club meeting of the year, the season is over. I'm sitting there in the crowd, and God will not let go of me. He humbled me. And I prayed. And I sought his face. And when it was all over, I went down to the coach. Now, this is a coach. You, you could hear this guy cussing from up in the stands, okay? This was not a kind, gentle, encouraging person. This was a get them moving and get them going and stay in your lanes and do what you're supposed to do with a little extra French thrown in for good measure. I waited to the end of the meeting, and I waited until everybody had talked to him that wanted to talk to him. And I walked up to him, and I said, I, I know you don't know who I am. I'm Chris's dad. And I just have a sense from the Lord that I need to make myself available to you and to the coaches and to the boys in this program in the role of chaplain. I figured I was going to get a good cussing myself right about then you 
you thought I was humbled before, I was about to really get humble. This man looked at me and said, I've been hoping we could find somebody just like you. Lord, Lord, Lord. What if I had listened to that voice? What if I had humbled myself and sought him and, and let go of what I thought God wanted me to be and turned myself into what God was calling me to be? It was a season in my life that lasted uh, about six years. I did this a little longer than Chris was in high school. Um, I called this my cussing congregation. I was, my name was Rev, and I had the opportunity, and I, I followed all the rules. If you're in public education, you'd have been so proud of me. I followed every rule that there is. Not, I initiated a kind conversation with boys, but any kind of questions about faith or, or life in Christ, they had to initiate those with me. And as they got to know me, those happened. There's nothing quite like sitting on the bench next to the kid who's a five-star prospect who just tore out his knee. And all of a sudden, his life has been humbled. His world has been shaken. And you just sit there with people and you love them. That's what he was calling me to do. He was calling me to sit with people and love them. I'll never forget one last story from this. Big Harold, we called him. Harold, as a, as a ninth grader, was already well approaching 300 pounds and was about 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> Harold's a big boy. Well, in one of the JV games, Harold broke his arm. And so as soon as the game was over, I thought, okay, I need to go to the hospital. I need to be with him and his family. And I... This is back in the days when you could go in hospitals pretty easily. Um, I went in and found him. Because he was only, he, he's still a kid. He didn't look like a kid, didn't act like a kid. But they had him in the pediatric side of the emergency room with a bed, on a bed that was this long. <laughs> Harold used it kind of like a chair. But to be there with him as they reset his arm, to be there with his mama, and to pray with them was one of the greatest privileges of my time with them. I also learned, and, and this morning is not a great example of that, but I, I, I'd had all the classes in seminary, I'd had preaching classes, I'd, I'd done all that stuff. But I learned with uh, my cussing congregation, if you can't say it in five or six minutes, just stop trying. Because, and, and the part, and that's why I look at your eyes so carefully even as I speak this morning. Because the goal is to stop talking before you stop listening. And that's something that I carry from my experience with my cussing congregation. We humble ourselves to pray and to seek God's face, consciously fixing and focusing our mind's attention and our heart's affection on God. I knew better, but it still took me a long time. Seeking is not a Sunday morning experience. The word used here does not, is not a one-time event. Seeking in this scripture, it, it's not a one-week Bible study. It's not a small group meeting. Seeking is not reserved for once a year revivals. Seeking is not what happens during a D-Now weekend only or during a summer camp only. In Hebrew, the word means to be before his, pace, his face and to continually seek to be in his presence. It, it's not, I, I saw it today for a little while it's it's living a life that constantly is willing to listen it's constantly willing to hear his voice 
constantly willing to seek his presence. And scripture bears this out time and time again. In First Chronicles, we, we hear, Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. In Colossians 3, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, on the earth. And then Psalm 119, verse 2. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. Seeking is not a day. Seeking is a life. Now, there's one more part of this passage that, that is the least favorite part. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, th this part about turning from our wicked ways. It, as I know that there have been people in your life who have told us, told you how much of a heathen you can be and how much of a sinner you can be. And I hope there have been people who've said, and you can know the grace of Christ. If you know him, accept him, follow him. But when preachers start talking about turning from your wicked ways, you just it, it's just time to go sleep. It's time to do something else. I, okay, I'll humble myself, I'll pray, I'll seek his face. I, I can at least look like I'm doing those things. But sadly, in many churches, there are those who appear to be humble, pray, and seek. Truth is that when you humble yourself and pray and seek him, turning from your sinful ways is not hard then because God's spirit has prepared you to let go of things you need to let go of. It, it, it's not... Some of you say, well, I, I just became a Christian. Does that mean i got to give up this and this and this? And what I say, let's not answer that question just yet. Let me help you learn how to seek him. Let me help you learn how to pray and to listen to him. Let me help you learn how to humble yourself before him. And as you grow closer to him, giving up things giving up stuff, giving up habits, giving up things that hold you down. The closer you get to Christ, the easier it is to turn, for you to turn your back on those things. I love to tell the story of one of my campus ministers, Mitch Wesley, led a retreat for students. And... Uh, at, at the end of this retreat, he had a student who just seemed really bothered. I mean, th this guy's face, you could just see it on his face. I mean, the spirit was a hold of him. Uh, at, if, if you've not stood here and looked at people, every now and then you'll see somebody that is just really wrestling with God. I, I'm not sure I see any wrestlers out there today. but <laughs> This guy said, I need to meet with you. And Mitch set up a time to meet him. He said, I've, I've heard all these things about being a Christian. He said, and what I've come to realize is that I don't have a Christian life. He had professed Christ when he was, when he was a kid. He had been a part of, I mean, he, he'd done all the things you're supposed to do to look like a Christian. He said, one thing I realized this weekend is I don't have a Christian life. I have a Christian lifestyle. Do you hear the difference between those two things? This passage gets at the very heart of that. And I fear for many of us, we have more of a Christian lifestyle than we have a Christian life. For a Christian life seeks him, prays, humbles yourself. In every way possible, tries to listen to what he's leading you to do. 
to take this passage seriously is to know the difference between having a Christian lifestyle and living out your faith. You might reasonably say to me at this point, but Joe, if I was to do all that stuff, that would really mess up my schedule. That would mess up our family's plans. It might even mess up Taco Tuesday. I don't know what it would mess up in your life. And what I would reasonably say is, yes, seeking him, praying with him, humbling yourself has a way of changing your life. So, yes, it will. But not in the ways you may think. You don't need to retreat from your daily schedule. You don't need to retreat from relationships at work and at school. In the midst of your school day, quietly and diligently pray and seek his presence as you study, read, write papers, take exams. A side note here, I, I confess to shaking my head and, and anytime people say, well, they've taken prayer out of the schools. Well, guess what? You can't take prayer out of school if there are prayers in school. As long as there are prayers in school and teachers, nobody prohibits you in the midst of something that you, you'd never thought you'd have to face. Nothing prohibits you from, from looking up to heaven or closing your eyes and saying, Lord, I need your help with this kid. Lord, I need your help with this principal. Lord, I need your help with this situation. And students, there's absolutely nothing that prevents you in the midst of a situation you never found, you never thought you'd find yourself sitting in, in the midst of a group of people that are doing things you never thought you'd find yourself in the middle of people doing that. You say, Lord, I know what is right here. Help me to be strong. You can do that. You can pray. You can seek. You can humble yourself. In the midst of your heavy work schedule, adults, you don't get out on this either. This is not just for kids. In the midst of your work life, how, how many of us have jobs that we come home from and every day say, oh, I am so tickled that I got to do that today? How much different could it be if you go into that job saying, Lord, would you maybe open my eyes to something or someone that you would like me to make a difference in their life? Martin Luther, uh, the father of Lutheranism, but, but the great reformer, Martin Luther, was well known for his practice of spending an hour a day, every day in prayer. One particular day, as he and his fellow monks and, uh, and pastors and teachers, as they gathered together. Uh, big schedule, a lot of stuff going on. Big, big time that was going to consume every hour of their day. And this person said, Martin, since you're so busy today, will you forego your plans to pray for an hour? Martin Luther smiled and replied, you are correct. Today will be a very, very busy day. I believe I'm going to need to pray for two hours. That's what I'm talking about. When we pray and seek his face, we'll seek his kingdom. This is the part where you come back to what you've been studying now for weeks with Tracy. When you pray and seek his face, you will learn to seek his kingdom. In Matthew 6, beginning with verse 31, we find what Jesus tells us to seek. Matthew 6, beginning with verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. It's not all the stuff you want. It's all the stuff you need within his will. 
Some people read this and say, well, just do this and I'll get everything I want. You're not reading it, <laughs> right? Seek first his kingdom. Pray for his kingdom. Humble yourself for his kingdom and his righteousness. And all of these things, these things will be given to you. Seek his kingdom. The things he wants will become things you want. Seek his kingdom. The things he needs will become the things you need. Seek his kingdom. The things he desires will become the things you desire. And finally, the task that Jesus put before all of us is the task that he came to earth to fulfill. In Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We're here to help people learn about Christ. Those of us who have learned the grace of his forgiveness are surrounded by a world that lives with guilt. We're surrounded by people who carry their sins all by themselves. When Christ would have us lay our sins on him to allow us to remember him, to accept him, to follow him, to believe in him, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and that's what he wants for each of us. If you learn to seek his eyes, you're going to learn to look below the surface. His eyes can see the heart and see the potential in somebody's life, the potential in your children's lives, the potential in your grandchildren's lives. His lives can help you see beyond the way people are dressed, tattooed or pierced. I know from college life, Sometimes the most uh, well-dressed kid that walks in the door may be the biggest scoundrel of all. And the kid that walks in with multiple tattoos, multiple piercings, and his hair six or seven colors may be one of the most remarkable children of God I've ever met. You never know who's going to walk in the door, and you never know who's going to walk in your life. Use his eyes. Seek his ears. If we just be quiet and listen to people. If we just be quiet and listen to people. You can hear the longing in their hearts. You can hear the hurt in their voices. It was amazing what I was accomplished, able to accomplish with teenage boys. Stinky, sweaty teenage boys by just sitting next to them and listening to them and then saying, Lord, how can I serve this kid? Seek his mouth. Listen as he measures your thoughts and words, but what comes out of your mouth should be, should be given to you by him, not given to you by your own spirit. Speak his words to penetrate the boundaries we erect. Speak his words to speak the boundaries that others try to erect with us. You don't have to think of a clever reply to those who want to challenge you or ridicule you. I've said it this way, you don't have to come to every fight you're invited to. Seek his mouth. You know, when Jesus was there with a woman who'd been caught in, a, caught in adultery, he took just a moment or two to scribble in the dirt. And I think this was Jesus' way of saying, okay, I'm not going to say the first thing that comes to my mind. Heavenly Father, I need you to guide my mouth. And it was remarkable what came out of his mouth to the woman and to all who were gathered. Helen Lemmel is a lady that you may not know by name, but I think you know a hymn that she wrote. And it is a wonderful way for us to end our time together this morning. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. 
and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We're going to sing that song here in just a second. Turning your eyes upon Jesus. Turning your ears upon Jesus. Turning your mouth to Jesus. Whenever we hear the gospel, lovingly, I think the gospel demands a response from us. That response is not always salvation. Sometimes that response is recommitment. Sometimes that response is realizing, I need to seek him more. I need to listen to him more. Come on. The gospel should prick something in us every time we hear it. And I pray that God's message this morning to you, something in the midst of this catches your heart and becomes something that makes a difference in your life from this day forward. Let's pray. Father, we do humbly seek you. We do humbly pray to you and humbly listen to you. We do ask you to forgive us of our sins and we pray, pray that as we as individuals grow closer to you and that as this church collectively comes closer to you, that this church will reach this community with a message that exceeds all messages and that we together as we give and as we go begin to seek a world that desperately needs to hear that message as well. Oh, Father, that we might learn to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Respond as the Spirit will lead you. Amen. That's all we've got for you this morning. Please come back to it and join us tonight. We're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. My dad and I are actually going to do Sunday service tonight together. So youth, you guys will end up being in here. We'll do our meal and all that over there, and then we'll come in here and join the adults. And we look forward to seeing you tonight. Jim, would you pray for us as we go?